One, two, three. One, two, right. Hopefully this is working now. Let me just um, check. Check. Uh, yes, it looks like it probably is. Okay. Right. So sorry about the delay. If you were trying to watch the other stream, I uh, had all sorts of issues. I was um, running uh, OBS on the uh, computer it's quite warm out here and i don't know what went wrong i think uh, maybe the computer just got its uh, knickers in a bit of a twist and uh, was refusing to play ball anyway so i'm just going to record this local so this video or this live stream is all about the fx9 here and some ideas and thoughts about how to rig it up different types of mounts different base plates where you put the monitors map boxes all sorts of things now it is a live stream so do please ask questions and i will try and answer those questions and as you can see behind me if i um if i pan down here you can see that i have a huge array of mounts and brackets and uh, and all sorts of things and we've got a nice close-up view of everything so we can try lots and lots of things and um, see what works so currently the FX9, as you can see here, is just configured in its pretty much out of the box configuration. This is what it's like out of the um, out of the factory, and like this, um, it's actually quite tricky to use. It's it's a very short camera, and I know a lot of people like to have it uh, on their shoulder. And if I put the the loop on, which I know a lot of you don't like, I don't mind it at all. Actually, I think it's not bad. Um, by the time you've got the loop on there, the camera doesn't really go on your shoulder. Switch it up off here. It actually just sort of perches on the front of your shoulder here. And that is actually, you know, the, the way it was designed. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, or at least that's how Sony would like you to use it. But obviously that's not how we all want to do it. It's not necessarily uh, convenient for a lot of things. So um, let's have a look at different ways of rigging it up. Now, I'm going to start off with a traditional base plate because I know that that's how a lot of people would work with the camera. So quickly, let's see how quickly I can do this. So the base plate that I've got here is a Vocus base plate. And actually, we can have, let me bring up the brightness a little bit so you can see what I'm doing a bit better. Right, so... I've already taken the um, foam shoulder pad off, and the base plate that I'm going to use is uh, this one here. This is Vocus uh, sliding system. And if I, oh, let the screws do that. We have the base plate part that goes on the camera, and then you have the shoulder mount part here, which that slides into. So if I put the base plate onto the camera and I'm going to go kind of do a, a bit of an abbreviated installation so first of all I have to take off my euro plate and now while I'm taking off this euro plate one of the things I will say is that for a very long time I was using a, I'm a VCT user I've worked in broadcast television for decades and of course in broadcast TV that's the standard plate and while the VCT plate does work an Allen key so I can do up the little screws. That's the wrong one. The other green one. While VCT plates do work, they almost always have a fair amount of play in them. And if you're using long lenses or anything like that, any play really is your enemy. Right, so there's the basic adapter on the camera. Now, once you've got that on the camera, you do have a few options. So I could use this plate directly on the camera. This is just the Vocus sliding system. And this is just a flat plate that you would put on your tripod. And then the camera can slide on and off of that. You can see it's now on the bottom of the camera. This would obviously be on the tripod. And you have a little lever here to lock it. 
and this slides forwards and backwards and that gives you a nice adjustable system so that's one way of doing it so you need to get really low profile perhaps doing a car rig or something like that that's really good and then when you want to go to your tripod the whole thing then just slides onto the shoulder plate and then you have a traditional uh, vct type, type thing so if i now put my vct plate on the tripod i can now slide the camera on and off the tripod really quickly really easily and it's as simple as that now why am i not using vct plates um, so much anymore and that's simply this if i get the camera now and i don't know if i get down close you can actually hear it there is always some play with these unless you use the very expensive ones i can't remember the company that makes them there's a german company that makes some that have an extra clamp at the back in fact the focus one does as well so if i do this clamp up at the back that does actually clamp it down onto the VCT plate and stops most of that play. But now obviously it's not quick release anymore because I've now clamped it to the VCT plate. So I have to undo this, which then frees it off and then I can release the camera. And it's kind of got to the point now where I'm thinking, why go to all that hassle when my tripod itself now has the Euro plate on it there which is quick release so i'm moving away from the use of traditional vct plates now in terms of using it on the shoulder this is now much better i now have a shoulder pad so it is more comfortable on my shoulder but if we go to the other camera the issue with these is look at the extra height it's adding to the camera it's almost two inches there uh, close to 50 millimeters or something of extra height being added to the whole rig and that just makes it quite top heavy this is quite a tall camera anyway and i just think that this isn't really necessary a lot of the time so i know people will disagree with me but um you know, there we go so okay let's take that off and we have the flat blades most of that height is coming from this base plate and to be honest, most of the base plates for this camera are that are similar. So let's get rid of that. We're not going to use that. I showed you this before. We could use that. And that would give me something very nice and low profile. But let's have a look at some other options on base plates. So let me take this one off. And I'm going to use a different plate. So these are, these are really nice, these plates, because they do actually attach to the little points at the back of the camera. They make it very stable. They're, they're tailored for the camera. But we're not going to use that. Uh, instead, I'm going to look at this one. So this is the Focus Run and Gun Kit. That's what they call this. It's very simple, very small base plate with a little shoulder pad. So let's put this on the camera instead. And this is really quick to fit and just do up the two screws so that's the plate on the bottom of the camera and if i sit this down on the table here you can see how much shorter this is than than this this is really rather tall and this is much shorter so that gives me a little shoulder pad back here and then I can put my quick release plate and actually you have a choice here you could use either the why is this tight this is new I didn't use this much you can use either the quick release plate that your tripod has like that to have something that's very low profile um, or the run and gun kit actually does come with a vct adapter like that so you can still use this with a vct plate if that's what you want dropping screws on the floor but now like this i can quick release on and off the camera really easily and 
because this is going straight onto the camera's own base plate here, it's much more rigid. It's actually much more stable. I know it's only supported at the one point. We're not supporting the camera back here. But when you think about it, where does the VCT plate support the camera? Just here, just via whatever your camera, your tripod plate is. So this is going to be more stable than this because it's just that one point of contact instead of this going onto the tripod and then the camera going on here. And in terms of quick release, it's just as quick, it's just as easy. So why add the VCT plate? It adds weight, it adds height and everything else. And the thing I like about this is we have on this now a really nice adjustable shoulder pad slides forwards and backwards on rails if you want to have longer rails at the front you just fit the whole thing with longer rails and that works really nicely now but he says what if you don't want to use a base plate at all this is where things actually get quite interesting now you can use this base plate so i'm actually going to leave it on the camera just so we can uh, just to speed, speed things up but you don't have to use a base plate at all if you don't want to but this one works quite nicely so on most cameras or a lot of cameras these days as well as a base plate sometimes you'll have a cheese plate on the top of the camera as i have here so i have a cheese plate here now what i quite like is to run my hand grip and everything else off top rails so this cheese plate takes a couple of rails on the top as you can see then this little adapter here slides on there and then what i have here this is the sony hand grip come to the camera the standard one but with a vocus adapter so this actually is replacing the sony arm so this actually makes things a lot more versatile and flexible as to where you can put it. Now, one thing I will point out, though, is the one place that I can't put this is direct onto here. Wait a second. Yeah, line. Because if I put it on here, the way the hand grip is designed, let me just tilt this camera down a little bit is it always wants to fall over and it really doesn't matter how you angle this it's always the case it never it's never going to sit flat when you put the camera down on the ground your hand grip sitting in the mud so instead of mounting this here what i do is i mount it off my top rods up here let's just slide that back a little bit and then let's just plug it in this is a little bit fiddly there we go and now i have my hand grip here i have all the usual uh, rotating adjustments and we just rotate it so it's comfortable What have I done here? I think I put it on upside down. Yes. Just spin this round a little bit. But now, basically, what I have is something that is very like an ENG camera to use. So the hand grip is where you would normally have it with most ENG cameras up on the side here. It's actually really comfortable because I can um, find the release catch. And I can put that at the angle that I want. So it's really, really comfortable to use. And I really like this. And the nice thing about this is I can put it down on the ground or anywhere else. And this doesn't touch the ground. It also means that if you're using a tripod where the camera slides on and off the base plate, the arm doesn't get in the way. And I found this to be a really lovely way of configuring this using this top cheese plate. It's um, this is a Vocus cheese plate that has a uh, rod adapter on it. You can see it there, um, but there are obviously others from other manufacturers as well. Now, so 
if you're mounting your hand grip from the top of the camera, what about map boxes and things like that? Well, you can do the same. So I'm just going to just tilt the camera, flip this one up a little bit. Maybe I should have put a slightly wider lens on here. And don't forget, you can ask questions if you have any. Hello to uh, Reiner in, in Dubai. Um, let's see, asking, uh, could I show the kit from Vocus? Uh, yep, that's what I've just been showing. Um, so I'm going to move my rods forwards. In fact, I should have put some slightly longer rods on. I've got some longer ones here. In fact, let me do that. I'm just going to put some longer rods on. Um, one of the things you soon find if you start using lots of different cameras is you do end up with rods of all sorts of different lengths. So, some longer rods. Slide the hand grip adapter back on. You can see how quickly that goes on and off. It's, it's a lovely um, little uh, device. And actually, Vocus sell this as a kit, this, this bracket and everything else, uh, the Alistair Chapman kit. Right, so map boxes. Right, so now I've got my lens on here. I can grab a map box and I can put a map box on. There you go. And I don't know if you noticed how easily that map box just went on there. Well, one of the nice things about the way the, this system is developed and how Vocus like to do things with their, their kit is that the, there is a set height for these rods. The, from the lens center. And if you look at that, you actually look at the top rods and the bottom rods, you see it's symmetrical. So actually that means that I can put that matte box on there like that from the top rods and it goes straight on over here. And if I take it off the top rods and I have to have longer rods on the bottom, but I, you'll have to take my word for it. I would just be able to spin that the other way up and mount the bottom rods and it would just fit because these are all symmetrical and they all follow the industry standard for lens height. So there you go. Now, while I've got the map box here, something I want to talk about a little bit is choice of map boxes. I think a lot of people use a map box that's far too big. So on the camera currently, I have the Sony um, 24 to 70G master lens, really nice lens. Um, and I've got this huge map box on the front here. But to be honest, the lens cap. Let me um, use the other camera. Isn't actually doing a lot. You know, this, the, the lens in the middle here is tiny, and we have this huge, great big map box. Now, things that we do have the Vocus map box are these eyes that you can bring in to create a variable mat, and that's the whole point of the map box is to mat off the lens. Lens, this map box is is overkill for this lens. It, it, it really is. You don't need a map box that that big. You can, it's a great deal of shading because it's so big. So the map box that I use a lot is this one here, little MB215 from Vocus. And that goes just straight on. And this is a much smaller map box. And it's already um, has a 17 by 9 aperture on the front, so it already has a mat in there, a mask. And that actually really with flare, and that's the undesirable flare. So two types of lens flare. There's the flare that's desirable, which might be when you shoot directly at the sun and you get the lovely rings of light through. And then there's the other type of flare, which is when the light comes in just off axis. It's not in the shot itself, but some of that light gets into the lens, it bounces around, it scatters, and that raises your black levels and makes the picture wash out. And actually, that's what we normally talk about when we talk about flare. And that's obviously undesirable, but by having a nice mat here, and you can actually put a filter. This is actually a filter tray in the front of this. You can put a filter in there. You keep the sun out when you don't want it, and it keeps your contrast levels up, and it really helps with what you get. So get the matte box that's the right size for, for what you're doing. Don't just buy a huge matte box because it looks cool. I mean, yeah, that looks cool. That looks, it looks all right. But this takes two filters, one right in the front, Anyway, um, this one a lot more expensive. It's very fancy, isn't it? That lovely wood grain one that I really like. Um, but it's not necessary. This one will actually do the job just as well, perhaps even better in some cases. 
Now, what about when you have lenses that telescope? So this lens here, it zooms. Well, some of you may have already noticed actually that I've got a mounting adapter on here and I just release the buckle. I can put the lens on that. And because this matte box is that bit smaller, it can do that. Um, you wouldn't want to do this really with a big heavy matte box because it's going to weigh the front of the lens down and, and cause other issues. So, you know, having the right size matte box for the lens that you're using, I think, is really important. Right. OK, so that's matte boxes, base plates, things like that. Put the camera back up here. Now, of course, there's lots of other things that you might want to consider when you're rigging up the camera. So at the moment, we've just sort of addressed what's um, in front of the lens, really. So there's all sorts of other things. Right. One of the ones of the FX9 is powering it and batteries. So at the moment, I have a Dynacore uh, U95 in here. It's a, it's a BPU equivalent. And the reason I use these and other similar batteries, and not the Sony ones, is these all have P-taps on them. So if I just take this battery out, you'll see on the bottom there is a DTAP connector, and I can power my accessories, my monitors, and things like that off that. Um, but it's only a small battery, and it doesn't weigh a lot. I actually want some weight back here on this camera to make it sit on my shoulder much nicer. So my favorite battery adapter is actually this one here. This is the core. B mount adapter, a few seconds to fit. So I do have to plug it in to the DC in on the camera, just goes in there and drops on. In fact, actually, before I put that on, uh, and I think I, yeah, I did, I left them in the house. One of the things you can do with this is actually there is enough room in here for a DPU 35. So the battery that comes with the camera, charge it up, pop it in here, and then that actually gives you a hot swap capability. So this is your main power supply, your V-mount battery on the back. And then if you take that battery off the back, the camera will continue running off the little BPU35 for a couple of minutes, few minutes, while you change your battery. So that's really nice if you're doing a very long interview or something like that, where you want to be able to, to change batteries halfway through, um, things like that. Maybe if you're doing a, a live and you're just waiting to go on air, don't quite know when you're going to go on air and you can see battery's going to run out in just the one moment. That little DPU35 in there allows you to hot swap and uh, keep the camera running. Now, the other way to is lots of different ways. So I have here a core um, Neo hypercore battery. These are really nice. I'm not sure if you're going to see this. Let's have a look. But there is a really nice um, display here that tells me how long exactly the battery is going to last. And that updates continuously when it's on the camera and gives you a very, very accurate runtime, you know, to, to within a few minutes. So that's really useful. Put that on the back of the camera and I'm ready to go. And I now have a little bit more weight on the back of the camera. So when you go on your shoulder, it's better balanced. That makes it nicer to use, easier to use. Instead of continuously trying to push this loop forwards, ever, ever forwards, because what you end up doing, if you, if you move the viewfinder a long way forwards, is you end up with all the controls behind your head, and you can't actually see them, you can't reach them. That makes the camera difficult to use. And of course, we have to remember in the version 2 firmware that's coming for the camera, that the um, camera will be touchscreen controlled. And one of the things that I do know you'll be able to, for example, is going to the status pages and change all your shooting mode, desk and queue, frame sizes, and everything like that on a single screen and just touch what you want. And that's going to make it much, much quicker than it currently is to change all those different modes in the camera. Much quicker, it really is. Um, so that's, that's coming. Um, oh, so viewfinder, I've got the Vocus rail on here, the Vocus NATO rail now. Um, I do find it better than the Sony one. The Sony one is not terrible. Um, if you over tighten the Sony now, yes, it causes the viewfinder to droop. It doesn't need to be that tight. Just put it on gently. But if, you, if you're still not happy with it, there's plenty of third party options. It's one of the nice things about the camera, it's very easy to rig in different ways. So, uh, one of the problems though, when you use uh, any of the V mount adapters, because you're taking the battery voltage 
and you're converting it to 19 volts to power the camera, the voltage of the camera is at 19 volts. So you won't get in the viewfinder any information about how long the battery's going to last. It will just go dead suddenly. Um, that's actually where having that BPU battery in the back really comes into its own, because when the battery on the back here goes flat, then the BPU35 takes over, and you'll see the display in the viewfinder go from the external voltage to the battery life. And that gives you some warning that you need to change the battery on the back of the camera before the camera just suddenly cuts out. So it's a really important point. Um, anyway, so what else can we do? There is also on the... Um, on the uh, 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 core adapter here, a little LED, and that will start flashing red when the battery is getting close to shut down. Um, that's also why I like the LCD display on these, gives me a really good power indication. Also gives me two D-taps on the top. Now, as another option for power, um, I also really like these PAG batteries. These are the PAG Link batteries. They're fairly expensive, I warn you now. Um, but they're really nice because you can actually stack a couple of them together. In fact, you could, you could have up to four, I think you got to eight actually, but I wouldn't recommend it. With two batteries on the back of this camera, suddenly when you put it on your shoulder and you start using it ENG style, the balance becomes much, much better. You do need to get that weight quite a long way back behind you for it to actually work to actually do something. Um, and it's far better, I think, just to have a little bit more weight on the back of the camera than trying to push the viewfinder forwards all the time. Um, and with the Paglink batteries, uh, did I bring it out? No, there is a little V, uh, an adapter that goes in between the batteries, if you want, that gives you a D-taps and USB power and everything else. And then you end up with a complete hot swapping system because you just change the rearmost battery and everything stays connected, detaps the whole lot, so you can shoot continuously, really, just by changing the one battery to the back. It's a lovely, lovely system. And if you're traveling a lot, uh, you're charging at night. Most chargers only charge two batteries. The more expensive ones might be four. But you can actually stack these on the charger, so you can actually charge eight or even 16 batteries at once. And that just saves time to get up in the middle of the night. And in case you're wondering what that noise is, that's the dogs uh, running in and out of the house. Being a bit crazy this afternoon. Anyway, so let's just take this off and look at something else. This. This has got a really bad rap on the internet, I'm afraid. This is the, uh, just looking at questions, uh, the stream bit rates tank. So I, have, I am recording this, so um, I will um, re-encode it and upload it. So this is the XDCA FX9. Now, if you want to shoot raw with this camera, you're going to have to have this. Is you know, I, I don't think we're going to see a smaller one or anything like that. So this is the brick that goes on the back of the camera. So let's just put this on. And you can also actually put a BPU35 battery behind this as well. So in just the same way, you can do that. Now, OK, so is the camera pretty with this on? No, it's not. It's quite big. But I think something that people don't actually appreciate with this is that actually, um, see if there's something that I can use the VCT plate here. If I put this here up against the camera, I'm not sure how well you're going to see it. You see actually the widest part is here. It's not back here. This is wider than this. And if we turn the camera around on this side as well, we'll actually find that this is the same width as here. The camera doesn't become any wider. Um, in terms of height, well, yes, there is this extra bump here, which is not particularly good, but it's still below the height of the handle. So the camera doesn't actually become any wider. Um, if we include the handle, it doesn't actually become any taller. And in fact, you know, it doesn't really make the camera that much heavier. It's only about 900 grams. And then when I put my V-Lock battery on the back here, that extra distance here, the fact that it's putting the battery a long way further back compared to this. In fact, this and the XDCA are not hugely different in weight. This, this is, I don't know, this must be about five or 600 grams, and this is 900. So batteries here, batteries back here, and what that means is actually on my shoulder now, 
this is really nice. The balance is great. Um, it's very much like a, an old ENG camera. And in fact, if you compare the size of this setup with an ENG camera, a traditional uh, uh, PXW700, any of those, this is actually still slightly smaller and it's lighter. So perhaps it's not pretty, but actually it's not that bad. Right. So what else are we going to have a look at while we're here? So I've got all these monitors and, and things here. So if you're going to be shooting raw with the camera, one of the things you're going to need is one of these, the Shogun 7. And this is quite a big lump of a monitor. So how do I attach this? Well, one of the things actually, if I'm not doing raw, I like this. This is the um, Ninja 5 from Atomos. Really great little recorder, much, much smaller. And you know you can mount this in so many places because it is so much smaller it's much easier to mount now one of the things that i don't like is these magic arms and the reason i don't like them if i just put this on here quickly is well there's all sorts of reasons there's a hundred reasons why i don't like these um i mean sometimes they're the only way you can do something so sometimes you have to use them is you put that on your camera, haven't you got it mounted, you probably wouldn't have it like that, you might have it. And here you go, you can see why I don't really like them. Try and figure out where to get, get it where you want, and you put it there, and it gets bumped, or you're using the camera, and it sags. And it doesn't matter how tight you do up this, they tend to sag and droop. And they get in the way, and while they do give you flexibility, to be honest, I don't like them. I find that they just more often than not end up annoying me. And then I end up taking the monitor off because I don't want a monitor flapping around on my camera getting in the way. So I've moved a lot more now to either, and I'm just trying to find them. So this is um, a little small rig knuckle arm. And small rig, these are pretty cheap. Um, yeah, they're not the the greatest quality in the world, um, but they they work pretty well. And because of the way they work, it's just two ball joints and a big clamp here. When this is done up, these are really, really tight. They don't tend to, to move around too much. They, they tend to be really solid. So there's that, or as you can see what I've got on the bottom of here, let's find the best place you can see that, it's these, proper monitor mounts. They don't wobble around, and actually you can move the monitor um, much more easily. So as an example, I'm just gonna put this on the top on the handle. And once that's there, it's gonna stay there. It's not gonna it's not gonna flop around, it's not gonna wobble about. I can eat I can change the angle that the monitor's in very easily, but it doesn't sag and droop. Um, or anything else, if I want to move the camera, I can lay it flat either there or like that out of the way. So that these these sorts of things work really well. There's a couple of different manufacturers, different ones that you can get. There's a, another variation there that has a, a cold shoe mount. This is specifically for cold shoe. And actually, this one I tend to use on my FS5 with the Ninja 5. It works really well. Um, this one here, I'm a cheapskate. I don't spend money if I don't need to. Um, this one came from Amazon. I'm not even sure what the make is, but it's actually quite well constructed. I'm really very happy with that. Um, but do I want the monitor on the top? Not all the time. So what else can I do? Let's have a look at some other options. So I have these top rod mounts on here, and that gives me an option. So here's a little short rod, very short. I'm just going to pop that in the rear rod holder there and then i have that little small rig arm on a little block that goes on to the arm and if i just tighten that up now this block was cheap and to be honest it's not brilliant it's quite tight to do up Possibly we'll buy a better one once some some of the restrictions there. So that's that's just that little block uh, on there. And now you just take this bracket. Is that going to come up? 
No, I've done it up too tight. But this does actually have little holes that you can put a screwdriver or Allen key in to do that. Let me get a slightly thicker one. Oh, he says he has done it up too tight. Um, good old multi tool to the rescue, whether it's your Leatherman or in this case a girder. And uh, I'm not sure what's even good. I'm glad I'm discovering this today. Actually, there we go. So what I can do now is I can put my Shogun here. And I can actually mount the Shogun there on the side of the camera. Now, this isn't going to be something everyone's going to want to do. But if you're doing a lot of run and run and running around, this is a nice way to do it. It's, it's out of the way. Less likely to get damaged when it's going in and out of your bag quickly. And then if you do want to use it as a monitor, because do remember that the screen on the Shogun can be flipped up and down. So you can have it in mirrored upside down. You just flip the monitor up, flip the screen electronically, and you can use it as a monitor. And I really quite like this way of, um, of reading that on there. Looking at this side of the camera, microphones. We have the standard Sony mount, and it's something a lot of people ask me about. So um, the microphone I really like is a, just a Atmos mic is this one. And this is the ECM MS2. And uh, it's not too expensive. It's a stereo gun mic. So you actually get stereo sound with it. And it's really good just for getting the sort of room atmos or if you're shooting uh, a documentary, just for getting that sort of background sound. And then we have the two XLRs here. And it doesn't actually, the monitor doesn't get in the way. So something else to think about when we're doing all this is all our connectors and cables. And uh, this is just an example, actually. This. Um, this is actually one I use with the FX9 right now because the FX9 at the moment doesn't output um, UHD in 4K, uh, so UHD at um, 24, 25, or 30p at the moment via HDMI, via SDI, only via HDMI. Now, the HDMI connector is here on the side of the camera. And by having this 90 degree connector, when I plug it in, the white angle connector. That's interesting. Okay, so I haven't tried this with the um, XD scale. It's quite a tight fit. I'm not sure how well you can see that. Um, let me um, bring it down to the other camera. So it just sits in there really nicely. And that's not going to get caught. It's not going to get knocked and damaged. Our HDMI is not the best of connectors. So having it tucked in there with the 90 degree connector really helps to stop it from getting damaged or broken. And that, that I'm really happy with the way that works. And that, that's the sort of thing that really helps your kit to not get broken, for things to not get pulled out and stuff like that. And, and HDMI cables, they're not that expensive. I think that was another Amazon purchase, actually. Um, because of lockdown and COVID and everything else, it's not so easy to go to a dealer to buy all these things. But little things like that. And then if you are using the, the Ninja, when it plugs into the Ninja, of course, it's 90 degrees up here as well. So it doesn't stick out, doesn't get broken does uh, a lot less damage. In fact, I can plug it in here to my Shogun. And then when my Shogun's down in its travel position, there's no cable sticking out. There's nothing going to get broken. Nothing's going to get smashed off in your camera bag and things like that. So you're going to arrive uh, working. Now, I'm looking down here to think, see, is there anything else that I was going to cover? Oh, yes. These are great little things. This is um, an... MPOW is the uh, the brand, and this is a Bluetooth adapter, um, so I can actually um, just focus this camera a bit better. 
you think as a cameraman, um, too close, minimum, minimum distance. Um, Bluetooth adapter. So this allows me to just plug this into the headphone port. I've got Velcro, so Velcro on the camera. Gives me Bluetooth, so I can use Bluetooth headphones. And if you're moving around a lot, and especially given that you can remotely control the camera, you, know, you can use the uh, content browser mobile app to remotely control the camera. So having Bluetooth audio, because the content browser mobile app doesn't have audio, just allows you to move away from the camera. You might be doing something you can still hear your audio, still check it. it does add some delay though. Um, the, this one's about one and a bit frames, maybe two frames, something like that. It's manageable. Um, so once you, you know, you know it's this that's doing it, so you can work around it. Um, not an expensive thing, but really makes life easy on a lot of shoots. Um, and anything else, well, wireless links, that's the other thing. If you're doing all this stuff remotely these days is wireless links. And for this, what I've got is, and actually one of the nice things about having this mounted on a rod, this show gun back here, is I can just loosen the rod, slide it back a bit, so I can move it a bit further back, so I can get at the cheese plate. I'm rushing. All this sits on here. I haven't done it up properly. Nothing. Right, so a Hollyland Mars 400, uh, really great little wireless link, and that can sit up there. And then um, I've got to do this all in the right order. When I'm traveling, because this is on that, that ball arm, uh, I see what I've done slightly wrong. I need to come off the screw that goes this way on the cheese plate instead. But I won't do that now. No need to keep you waiting. That's when I'm traveling then goes down here so it sits flat and flush against the side of the camera as well. And again, 90 degree BNC connectors, all of those things make life a lot easier. Um, don't think I brought one out, but normally I have right angle and 90 degree connectors, again, because it just stops stuff getting broken. Um, in terms of BNC cables and things like that, if you're running a really short cable, that sort of length, these really thin cables are great, but if you start going longer than, let's say, a meter, you want a better quality cable. This, this stuff's only good for short runs. And also be very careful if you're buying these from China and things like that. There's two different impedances. There's 50 ohm and 75 ohm. Now, a lot of these cables are 50 ohm, and the center pin is fatter in a 50 ohm connector than a 75. Now that's fine, it'll make a connection most all the time, but what's gonna do over time is stretch the socket on the camera. And over time you then go to a 75 ohm cable where the pin is slightly thinner, and you can potentially get problems with connections not being so good down the road. Um, so just try and make sure you do get actually genuine 75 ohm cables instead of the 50 ohm cables designed for radios and things like that. Now, being a radio hand myself, I have a lot of radio gear, so I've got both sitting around here. It gets confusing as to which is which sometimes. So um, let me just check any, if we've got any questions. Um, so no, the Ninja 5 does not accept RAW from this camera. It does from some of the Nikon stills cameras, but it does not accept RAW from this camera. But sometimes you have ProRes recording and you just want to take straight ProRes out of the camera 10 bit, 422 ProRes, lovely little recorders to do that. And if you just want it like a proxy file, maybe ProRes proxy or just as a backup. Um, I was using this, when I first got the FX9, I used this a lot on the camera. It was almost always on the camera, recording onto the SSD and ProRes HQ to get the best possible picture quality. And then I started comparing the quality of the ProRes files to the internal recordings of the camera, and I couldn't find a difference. So I stopped doing it. I'm sure there is a difference. I mean, this is much less compressed than the XABC, but XABC is a really good codec. Um, so I'm not bothering with this so much now. But again, it's just nice sometimes just to have that slightly bigger monitor. Um, brighter monitors, an HDR monitor as well. Um, most of what I do these days, I'm doing delivering in HDR. So being able to, deliver, to um, monitor in HDR on location is really, really great. 
Um, so that, that's you know, really why I had it on the camera a lot of the time. So um, any more questions? How about audio? Uh, do I use the MI shoe at all? Yes, I do use the MI shoe. So I'm not using I'm using the MI shoe right now. So I'm shooting this with my FS5 over there. And that has the uh, MI shoe uh, dual channel Sony recorder, uh, Sony microphone that um, it's got the SMAD P3A, or SMAD P3 adapter, and then the dual channel uh, audio receiver, UWPD audio receiver uh, on my FS5 right now, because I don't have to worry about batteries and things like that for that. Um, so down here is the, the belt pack. So yes, I will often use that on here, which is why I don't tend to mount anything off this mount, because I like to keep it clear so that when I'm using the um, Sony adapter and the SMAD, I can do that. Um, something I do is on my list of things to get is the new digital system, because that has a digital connection now between the radio mic receiver and your audio recording. So there's much less chance of any interference or noise or other issues because it's entirely digital now. Um, but that's uh, on, on the wish list waiting for start making some money so I can pay for all these uh, nice toys. Um, if I wasn't using that, I would actually be tempted to put my wireless receiver up at the front. It's a nice, nice thing actually about putting the wireless receiver here is if you've got it on one of these mounts. So this is that little monitor mount. And this works really nicely, actually. So if I mount that on there, and then this is a standard cold shoe mount, I can put my wireless link up on the handle there, and then when I want to travel, it just pushes down flat, completely out of the way, doesn't get in the way. And when I get to wherever I go, I can just bring it back up again, and that works really nicely. So a lot of this is really something to try for yourself, experiment, see what works for you. I've been doing this for 30 odd years, so I kind of know what I want with a camera, but sometimes you have to fiddle around a little bit to find the brackets and, and clamps and everything else that does what you you want exactly. Um, I'm really happy with my FX9 like this. It works really well. The extra length of the XDCA, when you put a battery, even yeah, you put your core batteries on the back, actually really helps with the balance. This little um, run and gun kit from Vocus keeps the height of the camera down so it doesn't become so wobbly. It's very, very rigid. Using the top rails for the hand grip and everything else means I can put the camera down whenever I want to. It's not going to wreck the handle doing that because it's off the ground. And it really becomes very much like an EMG camera, which is what I want. But then if I need to do any film style shooting, I've still got rods at the bottom, rods at the top, got plenty of spaces to follow focus motors and all of those sorts of things, lots of space. So it adapts very well to that as well. And in terms of cost, actually, these are not, in the grand scheme of things, particularly expensive items. Um, this sliding base plate, your more traditional base plate, well, it's very, it's, I mean, it's a very nice base plate, it's the one with the sliding bracket and everything else. This is heavier and it is more expensive. This is very nice. If you want to use VCT, I highly recommend this because it's so adjustable. Um, but it's adding weight, and I don't want weight if I don't need weight on my camera. Um, so that's why I sort of came up with this way of doing it with the top rods. If I'm, if I'm just shooting handheld, I'll actually take this bottom plate off altogether, and I'll just use a small pad, just Velcroed onto the bottom of the camera, and that works too. So thank you for watching. Um, I hope it was enjoyable. Sorry about the full start earlier on. Um, if the quality of this did drop down a bit, so I'll re-encode this and I'll re-upload it so you can see it in better quality later on should you want to. Thanks for watching.